fantastic. Welcome. Um, just uh, letting a, a few people join, um, but we will be getting going in the next 30 seconds or more. But again, thanks very much for joining this session, Legal Hot Topics, the rapid rise of UAE e-commerce um, with us, Al Tamimi. A uh, quick introduction from me. My name's Martin Hayward. I'm the um, Head of Technology, Media and Telecoms here at Al Tamimi. And I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that certainly for the last 18 months, we have been living and breathing e-commerce. And we were living and breathing it before the, uh, the pandemic and the pandemic really has just accelerated um, the, the rise of e-commerce, the use of e-commerce in, in the UAE. And as we know, really, this whole region, the whole of MENA, it's already the fastest growing region for e-commerce and the UAE in MENA is the fastest growing country. And that's why we wanted to focus on the UAE during this session. Um, and what we wanted to do was really to draw on everything that we've been doing over the last 18 months and really kind of convey some of those things to you in terms of really some of the key issues that we've run into. And these are not just issues in relation to the nuts and bolts, terms and conditions that you need from an e-commerce perspective, but they cover a wide variety of, of legal issues. And just to put it into context before we get going and before I introduce the speakers today, you know, the UAE is a really interesting case study for e-commerce. It was already very, very advanced in the e-commerce space. A lot of that was driven by government and e-government services and the move towards digital transformation within e-government. And then you add to that everything that we have in the UAE, a vibrant mall culture, a regional logistics hub, an attractive location for e-commerce businesses to set up in. And then you add on to that the people we have in the UAE, a young uh, population, tech savvy, internet savvy, millennials, Gen Z, very much using social media, using everything that kind of goes with e-commerce, very comfortable with e-payments, mass internet usage, mobile phone penetration, and then you build on that the infrastructure, the digital tra transformation infrastructure that we have here to be able to facilitate e-commerce. And what you have is what we see, which is the, this, the boom of, e of business to consumer e-commerce in the UAE. And that's what we're talking about today. We're not talking about business to business, and we've been doing a whole lot of work at Al Tamimi on business to business e-commerce. We're not talking about C to C, consumer to consumer e-commerce, and we see a lot of that as well. We're not talking about e-commerce in a regional perspective. We're focusing here on the UAE, but when we start looking cross-border and a lot of e-commerce platforms are setting up here on a regional basis, um, you know, there are big issues on the regional cross-border trade. And we're not covering everything. One thing you're not gonna see us cover here is tax. And that's probably a session on itself because looking at tax, both from an e-commerce perspective in the UAE and both from a regional perspective raises a number of issues. But what we are going to do, and let me introduce to you our speakers today, and these are the people who are going to be doing the hard work. We've got Andrew, um, Senior Counsel within our TMT team, very much one of our subject matter experts on e-commerce and is doing some really fantastic work um, working with e-commerce providers and particularly bricks and mortar retail providers that are moving out of the physical and into the digital, what we call the omni-channel, a physical and a digital channel to market. He's going to be talk taking us through really looking at the, the fundamentals within e-commerce transacting, e-transactions. We're going to move from Andrew to Claire. Claire's um, associate within our corporate commercial team, sits within our regulatory team, going to be looking at the new consumer protection law and what that means for for e-commerce and from there we're going to go to Willem. Willem's a partner in our corporate commercial team we particularly in TMT we work a lot with Willem because a lot of this e-commerce work really runs straight into kind of some really big franchising and commercial agency issues and that's what William's going to focus on. Isabella is a partner in our corporate structuring team and, and Isabella's been looking at a lot of issues in the e-commerce space in relation to 
having the right corporate structure. And we, we know in the UAE, we've got free zones and we've got onshore. And we need, there's a real, there's some real issues that come from that within, a, within an e-commerce space. So she'll be drawing some of those out. And we've got Omar over that, partner, with a, partner and head of our intellectual property team, We're going to be looking at some competition issues. Um, and e-commerce has raised some really interesting competition law issues that we've been looking at, not only in the UAE, but regionally, and Omar's going to draw some out. And then Andrew and I are going to end on privacy, um, just so that TMT can have the last word, but also so that we can draw out some of the real themes around privacy. Because And the last bullet on that privacy slide is going to be really important. A, because I'm doing it, and B, because it's about data monetization. All that data that e-commerce platforms collect um, and really want to use, really want to generate value from it. How do they do that within the framework of laws in the UAE? We're going to move really quickly through this, this presentation. We've got a lot to cover. What I've asked all the speakers to do is really to keep it down. You're going to see one slide for each speaker. We're going to focus on really the key issues. We're going to try and leave some time at the end for Q&A. Um, we're very hopeful, but we know we've got a lot to cover. So you'll see a Q&A bot a button at the bottom of your screen. Really, the, the, the point of these sessions is we want them to be as interactive as possible. So really use that Q&A button. Give us your questions. To the extent that we can get to those um, at the end of the session, that'll be fantastic. Um, to the extent that we can't, we make the promise to you that we'll follow up afterwards um, to the extent we can and, and really se seek to answer some of your questions around e-commerce. We've got a lot of people on the call, which is fantastic. Um, our job then is to make sure that you really get value for this hour. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Andrew, who say we're going to start with the key terms and conditions. Andrew. Thanks, Martin. So first point is, how is this legal? So uh, the UAE has a federal law on e-transactions and e-commerce um, dating back to 2006. Now, that law is based on a United Nations Commission on International Trade model law, um, which was from 1996. Now, without being kind of lawyer geeky, that's a fantastic model law. It's one of, you know, uh, a, a really well-drafted uh, piece of legislation and essentially was adopted by um, most countries as the base of, its, of their e-transactions law. And um, Europe's moved on a, a little bit since then, but um, so it, it's also good because there's kind of a consistency um, to, to the approach. So essentially the, the objective of um, the, the law, um, which uh, in, in the UAE is basically to um, uh, facilitate e-commerce and remove impediments to it. Um, and in terms of, uh, straight e-commerce, one of the fundamental things is in Article 11 of that law that basically says that for the purposes of entering into contracts, offer and acceptance into a contract can be expressed electronically. And also that a contract doesn't become invalid or enforceable merely because it's done electronically. Then the, the next thing is in terms of, you know, so what is that, what does that contract look like? Um, and uh, this is where you get a slight difference between lawyers and, and web designers, um, because um, if, um, if you look at most websites and that the, the terms and conditions of that, if you see them, are down the bottom in the fine print. Whereas um, if, if I was a, a, um, designing it, it would be terms and conditions at the top with a big um, finger pointing to what they are. But in terms of the, there seems to have developed this sort of form, which I think is part of the way of just the, the format um, of, uh, of, of websites and now apps, where you tend to have terms of use, terms of sale, um, and, and various policies. Basically, they're all part of, of your contract, and it's just how they get, get pre presented. Um, so basically, you know, in terms of the to having a contract, you need to notify people what your terms are. You've got to give them an opportunity to review, and then require them to take some action to show their their agreement. Uh, I mean, I, again, as a lawyer, what I really like 
is the, um, so I think it's Apple, their terms, you get notified that there's new terms, terms and conditions, um, you have to, to click accept, and they do this thing like, we'll send you a copy of the terms if you want them. I'm a lawyer, I never accept them, but it makes it very um, uh, hard for, for anyone to argue that they haven't had the opportunity to review those terms and conditions. Now, you may say it's, well, I can't do anything about it. Um, but that's where um, uh, the consumer protection laws and that come into place, which Claire will be talking about. So um, it, it's also, so that presentation and because of the, the, of the virtual world, there are certain things that you do need to adjust to. It's not the same as walking into your supermarket and taking something out to, up to a checkout. There are things that, that need to be looked at, like how do I, how do I get a how do I do a return? How I do, how do I do a refund? To the extent that that goes go beyond what the, the consumer protection laws require, you explain what those are. Even just things like if you if the screen shows a different color of product just through its resolution and things like that, how you deal with that. So that's why um, you need to be looking at having appropriate terms and conditions. As part of this, as Martin mentioned, we'll get into um, things with more detail as privacy and, and, and cookies. Um, under the TRA guidelines, um, if a website should have a privacy policy. Um, if you know, all websites use um, payment gateways, payment pr service providers, you will find that your payment um, gateway will require that you have certain terms and conditions in your web terms, generally around um, generally around refunds and how it's, um, if it gets returned to the cards and things like that. And then finally, just basically because um, whenever I go online, I have to prove that I'm not a robot, just talking about what capture is. And basically this is a, strand, a spam management strategy for your web forms. Um, and, and because you gather web um, information using web forms, because they use open standards and can be understood um, quite easily, that they're susceptible for, um, for to programs or bots that that can um, can send a lot of information quickly. Um, it's not because there's a secret war between us and, and and the robots that we haven't noticed here in the UAE because robots don't seem to be able to um, uh, recognise what a palm tree or a taxi is. Uh, it's basically the capture is the bouncer for your website. Um, and it keeps the, it keeps them out. So that that's the snapshot of what you, how you should be putting your um, site together. With that, I hand back to uh, Martin and over to Claire. Thanks, Andrew. Right, as we, we did say that we we're going to we're going to move fast. And as I say, it's an interesting just just to just to comment very quickly on what Andrew was talking about. The it's amazing the number of e-commerce sites that we see that really don't have those fundamentals in place, don't have terms of website terms of use, don't have terms of sale, or if they do, they're very generic. They don't reflect the business. Um, they're often not, um, you know, appropriate for the for the UAE jurisdiction. They don't reflect the laws here. They don't cover in detail what you would need to see from a shipping returns refunds position. And often, you know, you can flip over from that and you can see. Um, those sites which have, you know, just multiple policies on them covering you know, cancellation warranty and things like that. And it's interesting to see the different approaches. Anyway, consumer protection is a really important part, as you, particularly as you build those terms of sale, as you build those policies and you look at your compliance in, from, a, from a UA law perspective. So I'm going to move on to Claire. Claire, thanks. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. I will cover today briefly the new consumer protection law in the UAE and its effect on the e-commerce sector. Um, as many of you will already know, the new consumer protection law being federal law number 15 of 2020 was introduced on the 15th of November of last year. The new consumer law will replace the old consumer protection law and will come fully into effect in November of this year. During the transitional period, companies will have one year to comply with the provisions of the new consumer law and such period may be extended by a resolution from the cabinet. The cabinet will also issue the executive regulations of the new consumer law, which are expected to be published by the end of May of this year. But please note that there's often some delay in issuing implementing regulations, and we do expect some slippage of this timetable. As Martin mentioned at the beginning, the UAE 
um, seen a, an acceleration towards digital transformation among businesses. And the UAE cabinet quickly took stock of the changing econ economy as the new consumer protection law contains provisions governing e-commerce transactions. Article 25 in particular provides mandatory obligations on e-commerce providers to declare who they are, where they are located, and the types of activities they are permitted to carry out. They must provide consumers and the relevant authorities with their names, legal statuses, addresses, and sufficient information on the services they provide in Arabic and another language of the supplier's choice. Under the new law, e-commerce providers are also under notable scrutiny when handling consumer data and by extension should have in place appropriate cyber and internet security policies to protect the data. E-commerce providers are also prohibited from using the data for promotion and marketing purposes. Um, we expect that the executive regulations of the law will, prov will provide further clarity for suppliers and how they should fulfill, fulfill their new obligations. As with the old consumer law, the definition of supplier is very broad and aims to capture all parties involved in the life cycle of a product or services, including e-commerce providers. As with the old law, e-commerce providers are obligated to report the defective product to the Ministry of Economy. The MOE will then determine what action should be taken if the product is defective and they may issue for the product to be recalled. The term defect is defined very broadly under the new law, meaning that the likelihood of notifying the MOE of any, def of any defect is very high. Another key point for takeaway is that the new law has introduced stricter penalties for non-compliance and suppliers who falsely advertise products or services can face imprisonment of up to two years and a fine not exceeding two million dirhams. We envisage that the stricter penalties will offer further protection to consumers while purchasing online and will ensure compl suppliers comply with their new obligations. As I mentioned earlier, we do expect that the executive regulations, which are due to be published at the end of May of this year, will provide further clarity on how the new law should be implemented. And we do expect that the regulations will impose further obligations on how um, e-commerce providers will provide their services. Today, I've just provided a, a very brief snatch, snapshot of the new consumer law and the effect on e-commerce providers. And we hope when the regulations are published, we can provide you with further information and clarity. Thank you. Back to you, Martin. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, look, this is, this is a really interesting one for us because as I say, look, the, the challenge we have always with new laws is, is the fact, and particularly, particularly in the Middle East where a lot of the detail is in the regulations. And, um, you know, that leaves a, leaves a, a difficult period when we're transitioning from one law to another and we're waiting for those regulations to come through and that's really challenging right at this moment because what we're seeing is of course i mean we are literally getting contacted on a daily basis by um clients who are looking to set up e-commerce businesses and, and the new consumer protection law is is central really to their the development of their business and and how they manage their risk and so it's, it's certainly as we move through a new law, and it's a very useful new law, it's certainly something that, that it's important that it's addressing e-commerce. I mean, there's, there's already interesting questions around the extent to which the law applies to e-commerce entities outside of the UAE or e-commerce entities set up in the UAE, but that they're servicing a regional market. So we're already looking at those issues for clients and, and then looking at how e-commerce platforms as well that manage both um, products and services are, are covered under the new law. But thanks very much, Claire, for that snapshot. And as I say, look, really, if we link to Andrews and we're looking at the policies and, and, the, and then we link to the consumer protection law and then we look into the various um, guidelines and everything else that the, the at a, at a, not only at a federal level but at an emirate level within the um, departments of economic development really there's a lot of information that needs to go into um, the e-commerce platforms terms and conditions that need to be properly reflected and then need to be operationalized they need to be fought through the organization for us to some extent we we, we have an easy job we we, we, we get to document um, you know, the position legally, we get to work with our clients. The, the difficult job is with our clients as they try to figure out operationally how they're going to make this work. 
So just moving on, and as a, as a flagged at the start, this is really one of the key areas we've been looking at from an e-commerce perspective. And there's a huge body of UA law around franchising and a huge body of law around commercial agency. And it's really interesting as you look at the e-commerce approach and see how it how it impacts these, these laws. I'm going to pass over to Willem now and um, ask him to walk us through that. Thank you, Martin. So uh, today I'm briefly going to cover e-commerce in the context of franchising. And then as Martin mentioned, just address a couple of key points in the context, the context of commercial agencies in the UAE. So um, in terms of the first bullet point, um, what we found is in, in relation to franchise agreements, they typically have quite a long term. So they range from about 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. Um, which means that contracts that we entered into in the previous decade are now still in place. Um, and the issue we find there is that the provisions in those contracts that address e-commerce aren't really up to speed with the recent uh, aggressive rise in, in e-commerce, uh, in the e-commerce industry in the UAE. So historically, in these types of contracts, you would find that the e-commerce channels are reserved for franchisors. They typically take a conservative approach and want to manage that. And some of the implications of that is that there may be competition law issues that arise from that. Um, there's a possibility that the franchisor's channels may undercut the franchisee's bricks and mortar prices in the local jurisdictions. Um, there's issues surrounding customer service queries because typically you know, your franchisees would handle customer service queries at the bricks and mortar stores but in terms of the online sales, there's often a disconnect. Um, and then there's also, of course, question marks surrounding the capital investment that's required and the log logistical and operational infrastructure that needs to be put in place by the franchisor in order to exploit um, the online sales here in the UAE. And another issue that we have identified is that very often there's an inconsistency from a consumer point of view in terms of the product catalog that franchisors run online and that which the local franchisees run in terms of the bricks and mortar stores. Secondly, <clears throat> when you look at franchise contracts as a whole, you need to be really uh, sure that the, the following terms are covered in those contracts to permit the local franchisees to exploit the e-commerce rights. Um, first and foremost, there needs to be a license for the domain name use um, that's typically tied with the IP and the trademarks of the franchisor. There also needs to be access to the source and object codes in order to permit the franchisee to, to develop those local uh, e-commerce uh, pages. Um, there needs to be appropriate content approval rights. A lot of the time franchisors are quite strict in terms of what you can put on these um, local pages. Um, customer data needs to be covered and Martin will deal with that a bit later on there's customer service levels and also the governing law issue in those contracts. And I'll deal with that in the context of commercial agencies where that becomes a key issue. So again, what we see in practice, um, there's often channel conflicts, as I mentioned before, between the franchisors, uh, uh, global channel, if you like, and the local franchisees, uh, bricks and mortar stores. But in addition to that, there's also sometimes a conflict between the franchisors uh, global channel and if they have permitted the franchisee to run a local channel between those two channels there may be some kind of a competition and what we often see as well is that there's some form of cannibalization of the franchisees sales by franchisors through their global platform and how this is typically addressed in uh, especially some of the later contracts that we've seen come out is there some kind of uh, a compensation or commission scheme put in place where franchisees are compensated. They are also paid for fulfillment of the deliveries as well as dealing with customer service uh, issues. So there are novel ways that this is being addressed. One of the other issues we've identified is, you know, online is essentially borderless. So it's very difficult for a franchisor to control the territorial parameters that you would typically see under a bricks and mortar franchise agreement. Um, also, um, we're looking at the control of the landing pages, subdomains, and social media. There's often cross purposes because the franchisor wants to exercise more leverage over that than the franchisee is happy with. Um, and then moving quickly on, because I'm just running out of time, 
Uh, obviously, COVID had a, a massive impact. There's been a large scale investment from a lot of companies in e-commerce. And they also need to do some planning for the post pandemic situation where there may be a significant return to physical shopping in malls um, from consumers. Um, and then quickly, I wanna talk about e-commerce franchising. This is essentially where parties set up an e-commerce online store and they then look to franchise that right away instead of going through the traditional bricks and mortars route. That's sometimes a novel concept, but we find that franchisees are often quite reluctant to, to sign up for those franchises because there's no, no proof of concept involved, like you would find in the context of a um, traditional bricks and mortar store. And just quickly to cover off the commercial agency angle, as Martin mentioned, um, local laws are quite protective of commercial agencies and parties need to be careful in terms of entering into e-commerce arrangements because in certain circumstances, these e-commerce portals can be classified as commercial agencies and that will have extra contractual statutory implications for the parties involved. And then probably one of the most important issue that we are seeing for e-commerce here in the UAE is the concept of registered agencies. So this is where an agent has been registered with the Ministry of Economy, um, which essentially um, puts that agent in the place that they're exclusively the only party permitted to sell those particular products in the UAE. When third parties then enter the UAE with their online portals, these particular registered agents can then block those products coming into the market. They can even arrange for those portals to be shut down under the UAE commercial agencies law. And they can also um, leverage some commission payments out of those parties. So that's a, a particular aspect that everybody needs to focus on, especially when they enter the market with um, well-known brands and trying to sell it in a more general sense on an online portal. So that's my bit, Martin, back to you. Wonderful, thanks, Willem. And, and you know, this is, as you said at the start, this has really been a, a key issue that we've been looking at. And, and one of the things really that where this came out was the pandemic. Um, we went into lockdown pretty much a year ago, give or take a month. And what we saw was, um, particularly within the retail, just an, a, a rush towards e-commerce. Um, you know, there was a real economic imperative. And with that urgency, um, often there wasn't that um, appreciation of those existing structures that were in place. A lot of the time there was just this sense of, well, e-commerce online is completely separate to anything else I have, Can separate, separate from any franchising arrangements, separate from any agency arrangements. And it's interesting, I mean, these were, we're not just talking about kind of regional um, commercial enterprises, regional brands. We're talking about the big international brands because you sometimes forget that for a lot of the big international brands, they've always worked on a bricks and mortar perspective. They've, they wanted to get people into their stores. They weren't looking at, looking at multi-channel retailing. They didn't see the need. Their, their selling point, their value was, was their stores and everything around it and the shopping experience. And what's been really interesting, actually, is how the e-commerce shopping experience has actually looked to recreate the bricks and mortar shopping experience. The e-commerce platforms have, have identified the fact that they need to create this basically illusion of, of bricks and mortar shopping and everything that comes with it to really attract um, the attract consumers to come onto their platforms in the same way they would within the malls. But that was really a real challenge for a lot of retail entities. I mean, they, they were working on economic necessity. They needed to get online as quickly as possible. This is not just in the UAE. We've seen this globally as well. We've, and a lot of the issues that we've been dealing with have come out of Europe and they've come out of issues that, 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 that um, companies have faced in Europe moving online where you've got a lot of different regulation and it's flagged a lot of issues that um, certainly that the, the hadn't been considered before when you had this kind of single retail channel model. And the other challenge as well is when you get into the complexity of the type of e-commerce platform. Now, you know, that a lot of what we deal with is very simple individual retailer, individual company, single idea, build the platform, go to market with the consumer. But what we've also seen is the growth of marketplaces, multi-product marketplaces. You know, the, the, we know all the big ones, the Amazons, the Noons, things like that. We've seen a lot in a very 
niche industry specific areas, um, both on the B2B side, but also on the B2C side as well. And that brings added complexity as well. That's a complexity that goes back to what Andrew was talking about in terms of all of the terms and conditions. It goes into issues around consumer protection and product liability. It goes through to um, you know, really identifying who's whose liability is it in relation to this based on the type of platform that's being created? I mean, you know, people saw the opportunity for marketplaces, particularly when the pandemic hit, because that allowed, um, you know, it offered an opportunity for companies to get online quickly. They didn't have to create the online infrastructure themselves. So as I say, this is, you know, you can see the issues that come out of this. And one of the key issues that we dealt with, I'm going to move on now to corporate licensing and Isabella's with us, is you know online lives in a virtual world but we we forget that there are some real physical things you have to put in place in the uae to be effective in an e-commerce space and one of those is looking at your corporate structure and looking at your corporate licensing so isabella can i hand over to you please yeah, yes, Martin. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, indeed, the licensing aspects of the operation of the e-commerce business are, are very, very important. Um, you, there isn't a way for you to comfortably function within the UAE illegal environment without really checking what kind of a vehicle you would need to uh, to operate your e-platform um, in the UAE, where that vehicle would need to be formed, who can own it, what kind of con customers, target market can you uh, approach through that entity? So um, when it comes to some general considerations, the important thing I would like you to keep in mind is the dual nature of the environment in the UAE. Uh, on one hand, there are our departments of economic development throughout the seven emirates that issue onshore licenses for entities also, of course, in the e-commerce sphere. But you would have equally free zones that offer licenses to uh, entities in the e-commerce uh, space. Now, the important thing here is really to remember that the onshore authorities don't really use the term e-commerce in the context of issuing licenses. When you think about e-commerce activity for onshore purposes, then you would be looking at the activity that the DD call portal. So if you are approaching um, customers and what you're offering on the platform is a third party uh, good that you're selling, then portal is the activity you need to be uh, licensed to, pro to uh, then um, provide. Now, by way of example, I wanted to share with you two examples, right? If I'm Flora Trading and I decide to sell my own products, products made by Flora, on the website uh, of Flora, um, what I'm really doing is I'm trading in my own goods. I use e-platform as the means of trading, but the trading activity that I would be licensed to conduct extends to the e-commerce activity in the sense of offering my own products through the website that I, I manage, administer and own, right? And, and therefore, we often get inquiries from companies who say, well, you know, we're selling our own, our own products. We do it through some retail spaces, but we also are selling a lot of different products online. Do we need to have a separate activity to allow that we do that? And the answer is no. Um, under your general trading activity to buy and sell goods and sell your own goods, you are automatically authorized to sell those products through your entity's website. On the other hand, though, if uh, there is that typical e-commerce activity, right, that we think about where you've got the platform, you administer that platform, but the goods on the platform themselves are not necessarily the goods that you would own title to. These are third parties' goods, and you are fast 
facilitating that uh, that transaction, then you would clearly for onshore uh, licensed entities, you would need to make sure that on your license, the activity you have is portal. And for your free zone operation, if you have a free zone licensed uh, entity, you would have e-commerce activity on, uh, on your license. In the context of e-commerce, um, one thing is securing your commercial license. And that license will be the license that reflects the uh, legal personality of the underlying entity that gets registered. But there are instances where you would also need to uh, consider uh, the National Media Council approval, perhaps, if some of the content you post could be captured by the media-related uh, content. And also, a telecommunications regulatory authority would, in uh, many cases, need to issue their non-objection before you are able to secure your e-commerce license. Just on the final note, I would like to touch upon some of the free zones that have a um, suitable offering for e-commerce businesses. A Dubai Media City and Dubai Internet City for a number of years, they have been the ones uh, opened to issue licenses for e-commerce businesses. In fact, those two free zones were pioneers in understanding what the e-commerce business really is and that that type of activity would need to be awarded with specific licenses. So they were the ones to lead the way and then the other free zones and onshore authorities also assessed the model adopted by the media city and internet city. But there are others. There is, for example, Dubai Design District that we've been uh, we've been um, advising clients in relation to um, quite a lot design district that uh, really is the free zone that could provide a variety of activities, but e-commerce is one of them. Now, uh, the good news about those free zones is that uh, the free zones themselves offer an environment where not only there is quite a lot of understanding by the free zone uh, authority, uh, what that e-commerce activity is, how different types of e-commerce may, may really approach their, uh, their business, uh, but also those free zones offer uh, really excellent networking opportunities because they attract a lot of businesses, not necessarily competitors, they, they may, you know, have competitors sit there as well, but they may also uh, provide a good network platform for e-commerce businesses to meet with other businesses that can then approach the end consumers, for example. Um, and on that note, uh, really, please remember of the two environments, onshore and free zone, and the fact that if you're allowed to uh, carry out trading activity, then most likely you will not need to really add anything on your licensing regime. Um, back uh, to you, Martin. That's great. Thanks very much, Isabella. And as I say, this was another one that we saw, particularly during the pandemic, where that real urgency to get online, to keep business going, this was one of the areas where we found clients playing catch up. Same kind of same issue with the franchising and commercial agency arrangements. Really, the focus was very much getting online and you know, whether there were assumptions made in terms of whether what they had in place already from a corporate structuring, from a corporate licensing point of view was adequate um, or not. Or that they say what we've seen after the fact and a lot of interest from clients in really making coming to us and stress testing that they have the right things in place and also the right things moving forward because of course e-commerce is here to stay and we knew that before the pandemic and we certainly know it now and we're going to be seeing more e-commerce activity we're going to be seeing entities really working in the e-commerce space um, exclusively um, moving away from bricks and mortar we're going to see bricks and mortar entities as i say having that multi-channel approach and they're going to need to get their corporate structuring right to be able to make sure that they can they can work effectively. 
So we're going to move on now to competition law issues. And as I said at the start, this is really one of those areas, probably not the first thing people would think about from an e-commerce perspective, but it's it's a what it's similar to the new consumer protection law. We're in an area of quite new law in the UAE, quite recent law. And as a result of that, we're really reading between the lines as we support clients in really getting them to understand some of these quite key competition law issues that they may run into in terms of the e-commerce activities that they want to undertake. Omar, can I hand it over to you? I think you may be on mute, sir. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, hello, everyone. The UAE competition law was passed back in 2012. So it has been eight years since the law was passed and about six years since the implementing the regulations came in place. Uh, the law does not specifically address e-commerce transactions as distinctively from uh, brick and mortar business, but certainly the uh, restrictions under the competition law apply to e-commerce uh, transactions. The law really aims to regulate relationships between competitors, which we call horizontal relationships, or uh, regulate relationships between suppliers and their distributors or re retailers, which we would call vertical relationships. The uh, issue of e-commerce became a hot topic for competition law queries uh, during the past year because uh, for the first time, uh, many of the suppliers became uh, competitors to the distributors and retailers. So what used to be previously only a vertical relationship is now a vertical and horizontal relationship. So uh, the principal or brand owner is uh, also selling their products uh, through e-commerce platforms. and in many cases where the retailer was not selling through uh, uh, e-commerce, they shifted to online selling due to the pandemic. So that had its challenges where agreements had to be reviewed to ensure that the principal or supplier does not violate the competition law in a horizontal relationship. So among the restrictions or prohibitions under the competition law is uh, price fixing between competitors, competitors in, uh, in any space, whether online or uh, brick and mortar may not agree to sell the products at a certain price, or they may not agree to give certain discounts. Uh, and they should be independent in determining the price or discounts uh, for uh, the sales they make. Uh, also, uh, matters related to forecasting and uh, future campaigns or uh, discounts and uh, promotions, uh, these are sensitive information which, not, which uh, should not be shared among uh, competitors. Uh, where the principal or supplier is uh, selling through e-commerce as well as the retailer, they are considered competitors and therefore uh, there must be certain uh, protocols to be applied by the principal to ensure that sensitive information is not used uh, to uh, deter competition in the market. Um, also, uh, what's relevant to e-commerce and under the competition law is that uh, uh, it's not permitted for uh, suppliers or sellers to conspire with the e-commerce platforms uh, not to purchase or sell products from a competitor. So you cannot monopolize the e-commerce platform say, I'll, I'll sell my products on your platform provided you don't sell my competitors' products. Uh, also, you cannot divide the markets between you and competitors. So when you're uh, uh, talking about seasons or timelines of uh, uh, 
offering for sale products on e-commerce platform that should not be subject to any uh, div uh, division in the markets, even if it relates to type of clients, uh, so that competitors may not say, uh, may not agree to uh, uh, direct their sales towards certain uh, uh, platforms and agree with other competitors to sell only through uh, broad uh, e-commerce platforms. Uh, I think the most important aspect of all of this is uh, when you deal with an e-commerce platform as an intermediate, uh, the e-commerce platform is not the seller, but the intermediate. So determining the price uh, of what uh, the product or service is going to be sell, uh, sold should be by the seller or the retailer. Where the product or service is fulfilled by the e-commerce platform, then that uh, platform will be the seller and will be able to determine the price of the products as sold on its uh, platform. Um, uh, additionally, the issue of product tying, you know, again, whether e-commerce or brick and mortar business, you cannot uh, uh, force your consumer uh, to buy an unrelated product or unrelated service as a condition for uh, allowing them to buy your product. So uh, product tying is another issue that uh, has uh, seen a lot of queries by clients who are selling through e-commerce platforms. And uh, uh, finally, I think uh, the key message is with respect to competition law is that uh, the space should be open for everyone. So whatever measures taken uh, by a supplier or uh, a retailer, they should not be aimed to curb competition in the market by either uh, deterring entry of newcomers to the market, whether on e-commerce platforms or other, uh, or uh, forcing competitors out of the market by substantially uh, reducing prices to, uh, to cause uh, smaller competitors to be priced out of the market. Back to you, Martin. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Omar. You've, you've captured that wonderfully well. Um, in addition to having by far the best slide of all of us, um, <laughs> it, is, it is very much, you know, th there's a real analysis that needs to be done there in terms of as particularly as we're going to see more and more interesting e-commerce ideas coming through. And we're already working with a lot of really interesting startups who have got some really, you know, it's, it's e-commerce 2.0. They've, they've seen what's come out. They're building on it, developing it. You know, there's the, the marketplace ideas. They're building in lots of user-generated content. There, there's a lot more going into it where maybe 18 months, two years ago, we were looking at some quite basic e-commerce models. That's all changing and it's going to continue to change. And it's going to throw up as the models change and the way that um, the platforms allow entities to sell through them from a marketplace point of view how they build out their, their back end. We, you know, we talked about those terms of sale, looking at those, those customer, docu that customer documentation, those customer terms that you're putting in place. There's also that whole area of supplier terms. There's that whole area from a marketplace point of view, signing up those arrangements with the companies that are going to be selling through your marketplace and making sure that you're covering these kind of issues in that documentation. So... Last, but very not least, um, privacy in an e-commerce context. And Andrew introduced it in his first segment. And we're going to bring him back now to talk in a little bit more detail because it's, it's really important and it's really important to frame it in a UAE context where we really expect some quite fundamental changes to the data protection laws in the UAE. Now, of course, we've been saying that for a long time. We're seeing it across the Middle East. We're seeing it um, in different parts of the UAE, in the Dubai International Financial Center, in, in Abu Dhabi global market. We've seen new data protection laws. 
you know, as we as we project forward and we think about how privacy, how the privacy landscape is going to change in the UAE, what we're doing is we're reflecting that back onto e-commerce and thinking as you build your e-commerce business, what do you need to be thinking about from a privacy context? So, Andrew, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you one, two, and three. Sure. So, um, I think it came from the Economist, but there's a saying that. Um, data is the new oil. And um, that really stems from the fact that the sort of uh, many of the top 10 businesses in the world are the, are the likes of Alphabet or Google, Amazon, Alibaba, um, whose business is um, e-commerce based um, and uh, the, the collection of um, data online. Um, and with the growth of, of those um, entities um, and our digital transformation, um, the, the, law, the law generally always just plays catch up. It's a, it, it's a, um, the law by its nature is reactive rather than, rather than proactive, which is basically how it should be. We don't want um, laws predicting our, our, our behavior in the future. Um, but so, um, Many of the, the data protection laws um, first came around in the early 90s around the birth of the, um, the internet, and they just didn't really contemplate this world we're living in now. In 2018, the, um, the EU um, uh, uh, revised the, the uh, genera generational update of privacy laws through something called the General Data Protection Directive, you may have um, heard of, and really that's represented the the role of governments in balancing the rights of their citizens ag against the um, the role of, of commercial interests. I mean, commercial interests. Your role is is to benefit the the return uh, to your shareholders. Um, it's not necessarily al completely aligned. Um, now, and and so the the GDPR has essentially set a benchmark um, of 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 revised privacy laws, and we're seeing those come into um, this region, um, as Martin has, um, has indicated. But we're also seeing it um, coming into our, um, our laws in, in other ways. I mean, part of the thing that Claire mentioned, the new uh, consumer protection law, um, there's a consumer protection right around pr privacy. So we're waiting to see what the, um, the, the implementing reg uh, regulations there do with that. Um, there, there's similar um, a lot of things in privacy in, in the um, in the context of um, Internet of Things under um, telecommunications uh, regulatory authority policies um, and, and uh, also in health data um, and, and there's a, a, the most broadest thing here in the UAE and it's not specifically designed for these commercial arrangements but basically um, the um, the penal code essentially uh, makes it a crime to um, uh, for anyone in, in the course of the uh, collects information in the course of their, their prof profession um, to disclose that information without legal right or consent. Um, so that that's at the the privacy landscape. But as I was saying, it's not just that um, Google and Amazon that data is important about any business. Your client base and your client details that that's um, that's part of your fundamental assets um, and so um, how you, you collect that information how you use it um, is really important and um, and so uh, I mentioned at the outset that if you're in e-commerce the, um, the the TRA guidelines say that you should have a privacy policy in any case but you need to look at what it is you're doing there and essentially with privacy um, you know, the, the rough guide is, is, is kind of three things, you know, um, tell people you're collecting their information, um, tell them what you're um, intending to do with that information, and just do what you've told them they're going to do. Um, and and that, that's the fundamentals of, of any privacy policy. Now, now, although we don't have a GDPR law yet, one thing that the GDPR has done and changed, which I think um, we have to recognize as being the way of the future and you need to adjust is around the concept of, of consent. 
and, and un, under the, the GDPR laws, um, they've they've mandated that consent is is something um, very particular. And if you're relying on consent, it's basically something that's got to be um, given freely and, and informed, and um, and it shows that someone gives their consent by um, an affirmative action. And the laws basically say pre-tick uh, tick boxes or an activity don't um, constitute consent anymore. And also bundled consent um, it, uh, is, is um, it's something we've got to move away for. So you basically, if you're wanting to get and rely on consent, it's kind of got to be clearly distinguishable for each purpose and be in clear and plain language. Now, so I'm not saying that is the law in the UAE t uh, today in March 2021, but if you're wanting to future proof yourself, if you're wanting to get the information and want to be able to rely on this in future, um, I'm very much suggesting that you look at your um, your consent practices and how you get that. And particularly um, take care about your, your rights to share data with other people and how you write your privacy policies in that regard is really important because um, I don't know if many of you are aware of that. Um, there was quite a bit of fuss um, a month or so ago regarding WhatsApp having updated its privacy policy and shock horror, it was um, sharing data with affiliated companies. Uh, and that became a major media issue. Um, and everyone thought that um, WhatsApp uh, listens into your conversations. It doesn't. Um, those kind of, just, um, oh, not that I'm aware of. Um, but, the, um, but that really came down to kind of a poorly drafted uh, privacy policy. Um, that's going to that, it's that thing of saying what you're going to do and why. Uh, now, a common thing, um, again, um, the influence of Europe is um, when people are setting up uh, their, uh, their sites is having a cookie policy. Now, um, this basically stems from um, an EU um, directive, which is about to be um, re replaced by a regulation. Um, the difference there is a directive is something countries are to adopt a regulation is something that that has basically become the EU members law. Um, and under that, the, the requirement was basically that you um, couldn't put on any cookies or traces um, without the consent of, of, of the user. And that's that's the law in, in Europe. And that's why if you're buying stuff from overseas or even just um, uh, newspaper websites, you have the stuff about the, the cookies policies and setting, um, setting your cookies. That is not the law currently in the UAE or, or, the, G, um, or the GCC. But as I, as I mentioned before, when we're talking about privacy, this thing about in your prof, uh, profession, collecting people's secrets and disclosing that um, that um, arguably it could come within that. So as it stands, we would say, you don't need to have a separate cookie policy, um, but you should at very much be addressing um, cookies in your, in your privacy policy about what you do and how, um, how, you, how you're doing that. I mean, and not necessarily all cookies are intrusive um, and, and are about personal data, but that's the way that you, you need to deal with it. So not necessarily a, a standalone policy, but a, similar to the consent thing, it's something you need to look at. Um, and then uh, just finally, um, something you need to be aware of is, is that um, the TRA has had an anti-spam um, policy for some time, but they updated it last year to be quite specific rega regarding this um, um, spam marketing um, through um, text messages um, via a mobile phone. And basically, if you're, if you're doing a, a text campaign, um, essentially, Edisled and Do um, aren't permitted to send any of those messages un unless um, you have got consent from the recipient prior consent to the sending of the text, uh, text messages, um, the Edisalad and Do are supposed to verify th that you have that approval and ensure that there's no block. The person hasn't said, I don't want to receive messages um, before sending the message. And you've got to keep evidence to show 
how you've got consent. Now, um, so so that policy is coming into place. Um, it's thing for going forward. The only problem is that if you're a business who's been operating here for some time and basically people gone into your checkout and you've collected their telephone numbers and things like that, um, your record of consent um, uh, is probably fairly minimal if you've got it at all. And, it, and it's quite an issue for um, businesses here because as I said before, your customer database is, is such a huge asset. So um, this is something you need to be looking at and, um, and adjusting. It's particularly SMS and, and um, messaging, but it is in the context of a wider policy that goes to most electronic communications. So um, I'll hand over to, to Martin now. Thanks, Andrew. I'm going to leave you with one last point because we think this is really fundamental and this is a real TMT point because this is data monetization. E-commerce platforms just provide an amazing opportunity to aggregate, to collect, and then use data. And successful e-commerce businesses do this really well. And you'll see them in the privacy policies where they'll talk about the type of analytics they use. And then also, but the important thing there is we, you, we need to be able to create a, a legal framework that's going to allow e-commerce businesses in the UAE to do everything they want to do from a data monetization point of view to really get as much value out of everything that they're collecting onto the onto their platforms and you can see from what they're doing on the platforms everything from user generated content to all the advertising that goes into the, the links to YouTube and to social media they're really looking to bring consumers in and to really put that could that customer stickiness in place with an amazing customer experience and all of this is generating data but then they need to make sure that within that uae law framework they're using it so to andrew's points around the spam regulations to using the information from cookies it's really making sure and that's our job as lawyers it's really when we, this is a lot of what we do is working with our clients to make sure that they can fully and effectively utilize all of that information, all of that insight and intelligence that they get on their customers whilst making sure that they stay compliant with consumer protection, making sure that they stay compliant with the TRA regs. This is, this is a real fundamental and it goes to the heart of the value of that e-commerce platform. And that's where we're going to leave it. So kind of told you at the start that we'd go hard on the hour and we have and we're two minutes over and I appreciate everybody who's, who's stayed on. I appreciate you've got busy days, but hopefully that's been, whilst a very rapid walk through some of what we see as the key issues from a UAE law perspective in relation to e-commerce, hopefully that's, that's given you some, some interesting content to take away and reflect on. Maybe it's flagged a few things to you that you haven't thought about before. We've, we've been getting some really great questions. We're hard on the hour, so I'm not going to go into the questions now. But what we have been doing, and thanks to, to some of, the, some of the, um, the speakers who have been responding to those questions whilst we've been talking, there's a really interesting question on there, actually, in terms of how local courts will react to um, this whole concept of offer and acceptance under e-commerce. And, and I will take that offline because it's a really interesting question. We've got the e-transactions law and we've had that for a long time. And that does create a very solid platform for, for what we do in the e-commerce space. But it's to say thank you to all of the questions that you've submitted. As I said at the start, we will come back to you on it. But most importantly, let me thank Andrew, Claire, Willem, Isabella, and Omar, let me thank the, the Al Tamimi team, Joe Manal from our team, who's, who's really worked wonders on, on slides and all of the organization. We really appreciate the, it takes a village to put something like this together. Um, as I say, we're looking forward to continuing to engage with you on, on this topic. And as I say, we certainly see this as something that we're going to be doing a lot of work and we've been doing a lot of work, as I say, for the last 18 months. And we think we're going to continue doing a lot of work in this area. We hope we can be of assistance to you doing it. But anyway, I wish you a very good day. Thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to having the opportunity of continuing to engage with you on this topic. Thanks so much.